Last week I stated that we were working for peace not only for this country, but to preserve the peace of Europe. Today events move so rapidly that it is exceedingly difficult to state with technical accuracy the actual state of affairs, but it is clear that the peace of Europe cannot be preserved. Russia and Germany at any rate have declared war upon each other. Before I proceed <clears throat> to state the position of His Majesty's government, I would like to clear the ground so that, before I come to state to the House, what our attitude is with regard to the present crisis, the House may know exactly under what obligations the government is, or the House can be said to be in coming to a decision on the matter. First of all, let me say very shortly that we have consistently worked with a single mind, with all the earnestness in our power to preserve peace. The House may be satisfied on that point. We have always done it. During these last years, as far as His Majesty's government are concerned, we would have no difficulty in proving that we have done so. Throughout the Balkan crisis, by general admission, we worked for a peace. The co cooperation of the great powers of Europe was successful in working for a peace in the Balkan crisis. It is true that some of the powers had great di difficulty in adjusting their points of view. <clears throat> it took much time and labor and discussion before they could settle their differences, but peace was secured because peace was their main object, and they were willing to give time and trouble rather than accentuate differences rapidly. In the present crisis, <clears throat> it has not been possible to secure the peace of Europe because there has been little time and there has been a disposition, at any rate in some quarters on which I will not dwell, to force things rapidly to an issue, at any rate to the great risk of peace, and, as we know now, the result of that is that the policy of peace, <clears throat> as far as the great powers generally are concerned, is in danger. I do not want to dwell on that and to comment on it, and to say where the blame seems to us lie, which powers were most in favour of peace, which were most disposed to risk war or endanger peace, because I would like the House to approach this crisis in which we are now from the point of view of British interests, British honour and British obligations, <clears throat> free from all passion as to why peace has not yet been preserved. The situation in the present crisis is not precisely the same as it was in the Morocco question. It has originated in a dispute between Austria and Serbia. I can say this with the most absolute confidence. No government and no country has less desire to be involved in war over a dispute with Austria than the country of France. They are involved in it because of their obligation of honor under a definite alliance with Russia. Well, it is only fair to say to the House that that obligation of honour cannot apply in the same way to us. We are not parties to the Franco-Russian alliance. We do not even know the terms of the alliance. So far I have, I think, faithfully and completely cleared the ground with regard to the question of obligation. I now come to what we think the situation requires of us. For many years we have uh, had a long-standing friendship with France. I remember well the feeling in the House and my own feeling, for I spoke on the subject, I think, when the late government made their agreement with France, the warm and cordial feeling resulting from the fact <coughs> that these two nations, who had had perpetual differences in the past, had cleared these differences away. I remember saying, I think, that it seemed to me that some benign influence had been at work to produce the cordial atmosphere that had made that possible. But how far that friendship entails obligation, it has been a friendship between the nations and ratified by the nations, how far that entails an obligation, let everyone look into his own heart and his own feelings and construe the extent of the obligation for himself. I construe it myself as I feel it, but I do not wish to urge upon anyone else more than their feelings dictate as to what they should feel about the obligation. The House individually and collectively may judge for itself. I speak from my personal view, 
and I have given the House my own feeling in the matter. The French fleet is now in the Mediterranean, and the northern and western coasts of France are absolutely undefended. <clears throat> the French fleet being concentrated in the Mediterranean, the situation is very different from what it used to be, because the friendship which has grown up between the two countries has given them a sense of security that there was nothing to be feared from us. My own feeling is that if a foreign fleet engaged in a war which France had not sought, and in which she had not been the aggressor, came down the English Channel and bombarded and battered the undefended coasts of France, we could not stand aside, and see this going on practically within sight of our eyes, with our arms folded, looking on dispassionately, doing nothing. I believe that would be the feeling of this country. There are times when one feels that if these circumstances actually did arise, it would be a feeling which would spread with irresistible force throughout the land. But I also want to look at the matter without sentiment and from the point of view of British interests, and it is on that that I am going to base and justify what I am presently going to say to the House. If we say nothing at this moment, what is France to do with her fleet in the Mediterranean? If she leaves it there, with no statement from us as to what we will do, she leaves her northern and western coasts absolutely undefended, at the mercy of a German fleet coming down the channel to do as it pleases in a war, which is a war of life and death between them. If we say nothing, it may be that the French fleet is withdrawn from the Mediterranean. We are in the presence of a European conflagration. Can anybody set limits to the consequences that may arise out of it? Let us assume that today we stand aside in an attitude of neutrality, saying, no, we cannot undertake and engage to help either party in this conflict. Let us suppose <clears throat> the French fleet is withdrawn from the Mediterranean, and let us assume that the consequences which are already tremendous in what has appeared in Europe, even to countries which are at peace, in fact equally whether countries are at peace or at war, let us assume that out of that come consequences unforeseen, which make it necessary uh, at a sudden moment that in defense of vital British interests, we should go to war. And let us assume, which is quite possible, that Italy, who is now neutral, because, as I understand, she considers that this war is an aggressive war, and the Triple Alliance being a defensive alliance, her obligation did not arise, let us assume that consequences which are not yet foreseen, and which perfectly legitimately consulting her own interests, make Italy depart from her attitude of neutrality at a time when we are forced in defense of vital British interest ourselves to fight. What then will be the position in the Mediterranean? It might be that at some critical moment those consequences would be forced upon us, because our trade routes in the Mediterranean might be vital to this country. Nobody can say that in the course of the next few weeks there is any particular trade route, the keeping open of which may not be vital to this country. What will be our position then? We have not kept a fleet in the Mediterranean which is equal to dealing alone with a combination of other fleet in the Mediterranean. It would be the very moment <clears throat> when we could not detach more ships to the Mediterranean and we might have exposed this country from our negative attitude at the present moment to the most appalling risk. I say that from the point of view of British interest. We feel strongly that France was entitled to know, and to know at once, whether or not in the event of attack upon her unprotected northern and western coast she could depend upon British support. In that emergency and in those these compelling circumstances, yesterday afternoon I gave to the French ambassador the following statement. I am authorized to give an assurance that if the German fleet comes into the Channel or through the North Sea to undertake hostile operations against the French coasts or shipping, the British fleet will give all the protection in its power. This assurance is, of course, subject to the policy of His Majesty's government receiving the support of Parliament and must not be taken 
as binding His Majesty's government to take any action until the above contingency of action by the German fleet takes place. I read that to the House not as a declaration of war on our part, not as entailing immediate aggressive action on our part, but as binding us to take aggressive action should that contingency arise. Things move very hurriedly from hour to hour. French news comes in, and I cannot give this in any very formal way, but I understand that the German government would be prepared, if we would pledge ourselves to neutrality, to agree that its fleet would not attack the northern coast of France. I have only heard that shortly before I came to the house, but it is far too narrow an engagement for us. And sir, if there is the more serious consideration, becoming more serious every hour, there is the question of the neutrality of Belgium. I will read to the House what took place last week on this subject. When mobilization was beginning, I knew that this question must be a most important element in our policy, a most important subject for the House of Commons. I telegraphed at the same time in similar terms to both Paris and Berlin to say that it was essential for us to know whether the French and German governments respectively were prepared to undertake an engagement to respect the neutrality of Belgium. These are the replies I got from the French government this reply. The French government are resolved to respect the neutrality of Belgium, and it would only be in the event of some other power violating that neutrality that France might find herself under the necessity in order to assure the defense of her security to act otherwise. This assurance has been given several times. The President of the Republic spoke of it to the King of the Belgians, and the French Minister at Brussels has spontaneously renewed the assurance to the Belgian Minister of Foreign Affairs today. From the German government the reply was, the Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs could not possibly give an answer before consulting the Emperor and the Imperial Chancellor. Sir Edward Goshen, uh, to whom I had said it was important to have an answer soon, said he hoped the answer would not be too long delayed. The German Minister for Foreign Affairs then gave Sir Edward Goshen to understand that he rather doubted whether they could answer at all, as any reply they might give could not fail in the event of war to have the undesirable effect of disclosing, to a certain extent, part of their plan of campaign. I telegraphed at the same time to Brussels, to the Belgian government, and I got the following reply from Sir Francis Villiers. The Minister for Foreign Affairs thanks me for the com communication and replies that Belgium will, to the utmost of her power, maintain neutrality and Belgium expects and desires other powers to observe and uphold it. He begged me to add that the relations between Belgium and the neighboring powers um, were excellent, and there was no reason to suspect their intentions, but that the Belgian government believe in the case of violence they were in a position to defend the neutrality of their country. It now appears from the news I have received today, which has come quite recently, and I'm not yet quite sure, how far it has reached me in an accurate form, that an ultimatum has been given to Belgium by Germany, the object of which was to offer Belgium friendly relations with Germany on condition that she would facilitate the passage of German troops through Belgium. Well, sir, until one has these things absolutely definite, up to the last moment I do not wish to say all that one, that one would say if one were in a position to give the House full, complete and absolute information upon the point. Um, we were sounded in the course of last week as to whether, if a guarantee were given that after the war Belgian integrity would be preserved, that would content us. We replied that we could not bargain away whatever interests or obligations we had in Belgian neutrality. Shortly before I reached the House, I was informed that the following telegram had been received from the King of the Belgians by our King, King George. Remembering the numerous proofs of Your Majesty's friendship and that of your predecessors and the friendly attitude of England in 1870 and the proof of friendship she has just given us again, 
I make a supreme appeal to the diplomatic intervention of Your Majesty's Government to safeguard the integrity of Belgium. Diplomatic intervention took place last week on our part. What can diplomatic intervention do now? We have great and vital interests in the independence and integrity is the least part of Belgium. If Belgium is compelled to submit to allow her neutrality to be violated, of course, the situation is clear. Even if by agreement she, is, ha, she admitted the violation of her neutrality, it is clear she could only do so under duress. The smaller states in that region of Europe ask but one thing. Their one desire is that they should be left alone and independent. The one thing they fear is, I think, not so much that their integrity, but that their independence should be interfered with. If in this war, which is before Europe, the neutrality of those countries is violated, if the troops of one of the combatants violate its neutrality and no action be taken to resent it at the end of war, whatever the integrity may be, the independence will be gone. No, sir. If it be the case that there has been anything in the nature of an ultimatum to Belgium, asking her to compromise or violate her neutrality, whatever may have been offered to her in return, her independence is gone if that holds. If her independence goes, the independence of Holland will follow. <clears throat> I ask the House, from the point of view of British interests, to consider what may be at stake. If France is beaten in a struggle of life and death, beaten to her knees, loses her position as a great power, becomes subordinate to the will and power of one greater than herself, consequences which I do not anticipate, <coughs> because I am sure that France has the power to defend herself with all the energy and ability and patriotism which she has shown so often. Still, if that were to happen and if Belgium fell under the same dominating influence and then Holland and then Denmark, then would not Mr. Gladstone's words come true that just opposite to us there would be a common interest against the unmeasured aggrandizement of any power. It may be said, I suppose, <coughs> that we might stand aside, husband our strength, and that whatever happened in the course of this war, at the end of it intervene with effect to put things right and to adjust them to our own point of view. If in a crisis like this we run away from those obligations of honour and interest as regards the Belgian treaty, I doubt whether whatever material force we might have at the end, it would be of very much value in the face of the respect that we should have lost. And I do not believe whether a great power stands outside this war or not, it is going to be in a position at the end of it to exert its superior strength. For us with a powerful fleet, which we believe able to protect our commerce, to protect our shores, and to protect our interests, if we are engaged in war we shall suffer, but little more than we shall suffer even if we stand aside. We are going to suffer, I am afraid, terribly in this war, whether we are in it or whether we stand aside. Foreign trade is going to stop, not because the trade routes are closed, but because there is no trade at the other end. Continental nations engaged in war, <clears throat> all their populations, all their energies, all their wealth engaged in a desperate struggle, they cannot carry on the trade with us that they are carrying on in times of peace, whether we are parties to the war or whether we are not. I do not believe for a moment that at the end of this war, even if we stood aside and remained aside, we should be in a position, a material position, to use our force decisively to undo what had happened in the course of the war, to prevent the whole of the West of Europe opposite to us. If that had been the result of the war, falling under the domination of a single power, and I'm quite sure that our moral position would be such as... <clears throat> to have lost us all respect. I can only say that I have put the question of Belgium somewhat hypothetically, because I am not yet sure of all the facts, but if the facts turn out to be as they have reached us at present, it is quite clear that there is an obligation on this country to do its utmost to prevent the consequences to which those facts will lead if they are undisputed. One thing I would say, the one bright spot in the whole of this terrible situation is Ireland. <coughs> the general feeling throughout Ireland, and I would like to be 
and like this to be clearly understood abroad does not make that a consideration that we feel we have to take into account. I have told the House how far we have at present gone in commi commitments and the conditions which influence our policy, and I have put and dealt at length to the House upon how vital the condition of the neutrality of Belgium is. What other policy is there before the House? There is but one way in which the government could make certain at the present moment of keeping outside this war, and that would be that it should immediately issue a proclamation of unconditional neutrality. We cannot do that. We have made the commitment to France that I have read to the House which prevents us doing that. We have got the consideration of Belgium which prevents us also from any unconditional neutrality, and without these conditions absolutely satisfied and satisfactory, we are bound not to shrink from proceeding to the use of all the forces in our power. If we did take that line by saying, we will have nothing whatever to do with this matter under no conditions, the Belgian treaty obligations, the desirable, the possible position in the Mediterranean with damage to British interests and what may happen to France <clears throat> from our failure to support France, if we were to say that all those things matter nothing, whereas nothing, and to say we would stand aside, we should, I believe, sacrifice our respect and good name and reputation before the world, <coughs> and should not escape the most serious and grave economic consequences. My object has been to explain the view of the government and to place before the House the issue and the choice. I do not for a moment conceal, after what I have said and after the information incomplete as it is that I have given to the House with regard to Belgium, that we must be prepared and we are prepared for the consequences of having to use all the strength we have at any moment. We know not how soon to defend ourselves and to take our part. We know if the facts all be as I have stated them, though I have announced no intending aggressive action on our part, no final decision to resort to force at a moment's notice until we know the whole of the case that the use of it may be forced upon us. As far as the forces of the Crown are concerned, we are ready. I believe the Prime Minister and my right honourable friend, the First Lord of the Admiralty, have no doubt whatever that the readiness and the efficiency of those forces were never at a higher mark than they are today. And never was there a time when confidence was more justified in the power of the Navy to protect our commerce <clears throat> and to protect our shores. The thought is with us always of the suffering and misery entailed, from which no country in Europe will escape, and from which no ab abdication or neutrality will save us. The amount of harm that can be done by an enemy ship to our trade is infinitesimal, compared with the amount of harm that must be done by the economic condition that is caused on the continent. The most awful responsibility is resting upon the government in deciding what to advise the House of Commons to do. We have disclosed our minds to the House of Commons. We have disclosed the issue, the information which we have, <clears throat> and made clear to the House. I trust that we are prepared to face that situation and that it should develop and that should it develop as probably it may develop, we will face it. We worked for a peace up to the last moment and beyond the last moment. How hard, how persistently and how earnestly we strove for a peace last week, the House will see from the papers that will be before it. But that is over as far as the peace of Europe is concerned. We are now face to face with the situation and all the consequences which it may yet uh, have to unfold. Fold. We believe we shall have the support of the House at large in proceeding to whatever the consequences may be and whatever measures may be forced upon us by the development of facts or action taken by others. I believe the country so quickly has the situation been forced upon it has not had time to realize the issue. It perhaps is still thinking of the quarrel between Austria and Serbia and not the complications of this matter which have grown out of the quarrel between Austria and Serbia. Russia and Germany we know are at war. We do not yet know officially that Austria, the ally from Germany, whom Germany is to support, is yet at war with Russia. We know that a good deal has been happening on the French frontier. We do not know that the German ambassador has left Paris. 
The situation has developed so rapidly that technically as regards the condition of the war, it is most difficult to describe what has actually happened. I wanted to bring out the underlying issues which would affect our own conduct and our own policy and to put them clearly. I have now put the vital facts before the House, and if, as seems not improbable, we are forced and rapidly forced to take our stand upon those issues, then I believe when the country realizes what is at stake, what the real issues are, the magnitude of the impending dangers in the west of Europe, which I have endeavored to ascribe to the House, we shall be supported throughout not only by the House of Commons, but by the determination, the resolution, the courage and the endurance of the whole country. I want to give the House some information which I have received and which has, was not in my possession when I made my statement this afternoon. It is information I have received from the Belgian legation in London and is to the following effect. Germany sent yesterday evening at 7 o'clock a note proposing to Belgium friendly neutrality covering free passage on Belgian territory and promising <coughs> maintenance of independence of the kingdom and possession at the conclusion of peace and threatening in case of refusal to treat Belgium as an enemy. A time limit of 12 hours was fixed for the reply. <coughs> the Belgians have answered that an attack on their neutrality would be a flagrant violation of the rights of nations and that to accept the German proposal would be to sacrifice the honor of a nation. Conscious of its duty, Belgium is finally resolved to repel aggression by all possible means. Of course, I can only say that the government are prepared to take into grave consideration the information which they have received. I make no further comment upon it.